the organization started from a gift um, in about 1995 from a gentleman who had lost his wife and mother to their, I think, three children, young children. We're also the oldest sarcoma organization in the U.S. We focus everything to ensure that no one faces sarcoma alone while keeping our program's mission focused. Sarcoma research is widely underfunded, and we hope to alleviate some of that as much as we possibly can. Touching story and working with the pediatric patients, especially we always encourage such kind of situations and it's sad but uh, hopefully the sarcoma research is uh, improving and uh, we will find uh, someday the best cure for our patients. Hello everyone and welcome to today's interview, Sarcoma Talks. I'm Shushan Hosepian, your host as always. And today we have the honor of speaking with uh, Joe McNeil, who is the Executive Director of the Northwest Sarcoma Foundation. Hello, uh, Joe, and thank you for uh, accepting our invitation. Good morning and thank you very much for offering. We're happy to be here. Pleasure is all ours, and let's learn more about her journey, the foundation's mission, and the impactful work that they are doing. So let's start from the beginning. Can you share more about your journey and the background that led you to become the executive director of the Northwest Sarcoma Foundation? Sure. Um, so I started um, as a fundraiser for a long-distance walk for another organization, cancer organization. Um, and during the event, I thought, I could do this, I could produce something like this. Uh, and then a very a, an opportunity presented itself um, and it gave me the chance to learn. Uh, after a few years of working for various nonprofit organizations um, from large national to smaller community local types, uh, I decided I wanted to be an executive director for a small nonprofit organization with a mission that I could get behind. Um, I took the steps to get some further education as an executive director um, and during the schooling, we did an exercise uh, that focused our interests, which led me to focus on two areas, health or cat and dog welfare. <laughs> uh, and then I used my mantra of finding a smaller nonprofit um, as I searched for the right fit. Um, being so focused on a smaller organization, it took a while, um, but I did feel like I found the right organization. I've been here for just about four and a half years. Oh, that's interesting to hear. <laughs> And uh, can you share the history and mission of the foundation? What uh, inspired its creation? Yeah, the organization started from a gift um, in about 1995 from a gentleman who had lost his wife and mother to their, I think, three children, young children at the time. And uh, the gift was dedicated to helping others through their sarcoma journey. Uh, Dr. Ernest Conrad III was their physician who helped the family during their journey, uh, and he was tasked with starting the organization. Um, using his connections from years of work with sarcoma patients in the area, he and a few others started the process of forming the nonprofit organization, which formalized in April of uh, 1996. Uh, the Northwest Sarcoma, sarcoma Foundation is, the law, uh, is a local organization, um, keeping it regional. Uh, so we're Washington, Oregon, Alaska, Idaho, and Montana is our focus. Um, but we're also the oldest sarcoma organization in the U.S. Um, I think the national organization is about six months behind us. <laughs> not much, not much. <laughs> we, we get to keep that title. <laughs> um, and then um, obviously when it was formed, they, they uh, said establishing it and keeping it as a local, their original purpose was to establish a place of support and education for those living with sarcoma or other rare bone term tumor diseases in our region. Um, and that has now um, obviously uh, the focus in the mission has been better defined, and now it's uh, to provide hope, education, and support to anyone affected by sarcoma in the Pacific Northwest while investing in research to imp improve cure rates for sarcomas. So That's that great. is yeah. <laughs> wonderful. And yeah. what are those uh, key projects that the foundation offers to sarcoma community right now? Yeah, the oldest and largest program is our HELPS Financial Assistance Grant Programs, um, which over time has evolved to the Bob Ortblad HELPS Grants and the Jenna Westerholm Pediatric HELPS Grant Program. Um, the program uh, hopes to alleviate some financial burdens to individuals and families while going through treatment. Uh, in 2016, there was a study done, um, I believe, through the help of uh, 
uh, the Night Cancer Institute, I think, uh, or something. They have a community um, grant program. Study was done. Uh, study determined just two biggest challenges for sarcoma patients is um, financial burden and feelings of isolation. Uh, we were early adopters to providing help for the financial burden side of things. Um, and we've created other programs to address and support the challenges of isolation. Uh, over the years, there have been various types of meet and greets. Um, but during the pandemic, it was particularly challenging. Um, with the help of a volunteer who had lost her husband just prior to the world shutdown, uh, we created our casual chat online support program. Um, we have we had uh, groups for adult patients and survivors, uh, caregivers. We had a teen group, and then we had one for those who had lost someone to sarcoma. Um, again, with further changes in the world and learning what works and doesn't work, uh, the program currently stands with two of our chat groups still existing online. Um, one is for obviously the patients and survivors and the other for caregivers. We like to joke that we're global, um, being that we had a woman from Russia who had joined us um, for the patient and survivor group uh, one time. Or I think it was, yeah, I think she, or caregiver group. She lost her brother, I believe it was. But um, so we joke that we're global in that way. Um, but we found other ways to connect in person. The other two groups have found ways to connect in person. Uh, so we don't have that online presence anymore. We, uh, we learned that we're not e experts at teens and, <laughs> and things like that. Um, the same volunteer also helped us relaunch and evolve, uh, an older program that had been lost, uh, over time and it's the care package program. So we provide care packages to patient, patients in treatment. Uh, which include items include things that will help them during treatment, um, blankets, water bottles, things like that. Uh, plus, we have a care package that we send to those that have lost somebody to sarcoma. Um, so that was a, a kind of a passion part of that for that one volunteer. So she helped launch that um, with her mind and her finances. So it was an excellent uh, pairing. Um, we're also excited that over the last few years, we've been able to bring back some other programs that were delayed due to the pandemic. So we have the Dragon Slayer Pediatric Fun Days in local pediatric treatment centers. Um, we do periodically and bring fun and games to the kids, plus the Community Fun Days, which provides an experience for patients and survivors and their family members to do something they may not have been able to do or financially afford. Um, and it brings them together as a community so they understand they do have a sarcoma community. And as always, uh, we focus everything to ensure that no one faces sarcoma alone while keeping our program's mission focused. Yeah, that's really wonderful, the work that you are doing, especially uh, the chatting was really interesting. And yeah, it's uh, very uh, inspiring. And uh, you mentioned a lot of projects, but I imagine that the, there have been one or some of them that were the most significant achievements for your um for yourself personally under your leadership. Could you mention that? So under my leadership, um, I I think that um, we, well, we received a very large grant, uh, which allowed us to hire an additional staff person and purchase and formalize a donor relationship tool. Mm -hmm. um, these have been game changers for us. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, it certainly allowed us to expand our programs um, and made us a more robust organization in supporting our sarcoma patients. Uh, so it's been kind of that key focus. I let you know, everybody wants to think they've had some big, 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 big thing. But I do have to say that that grant was a, a game changer for the organization and allowing us to better understand our donors um, and help them, which then allows us to expand and help our patients. Yeah, that's nice to hear. And uh, you mentioned about the uh, challenges uh, during the pandemic, but uh, what are the biggest challenges the foundation faces in supporting sarcoma patients and uh, how particularly you are addressing these challenges? Um, so obviously I mentioned the financial burden isolation. Um, we've been addressing those obviously very for a long time, um, but it's always in the forefront of our programs that we create and ensure that we address those two challenges first and foremost. But another is research um, with the government going back and forth about how they support cancer research. Um, small organizations have really had to step up and we started funding research grants in 2012 and have continued to support research since, although um, 
Many of the other circum organizations, that's their main focus. Um, it isn't our dedicated focus, but it's still part of our mission and we will continue for a long time. Sarcoma research is widely underfunded and we hope to alleviate some of that as much as we possibly can. So I think for us, that's a challenge. Um, you know, we try to make sure that every year we're providing some sort of support. And we do focus that even on our own region too. A lot of our, re although we open it up um, kind of nationally uh, and globally, but um, we, try, we do try to focus a lot on the research that's happening in our area. We're lucky enough to have two sarcoma, um, sarcoma centers of excellence in our area. Yeah, so. yeah that's wonderful. Yeah, and uh, what are the long-term goals of the foundation and what initiatives you are mostly excited about? Sure. Um, so we have two things that I like to call the big, hairy, audacious goals. So the BHAGs. <laughs> uh, we'd like to obviously increase the financial amounts we provide to help our patient grants. Um, you know, right now uh, we've had to reduce that amount over time through the through the pandemic and we've brought it back. Um, but we'd like to make it more because we know the financial burden that patients are facing is more just with inflation. Um, and then at some point, uh, we want to add a bereavement grant to help families with the financial burden that comes with losing um, someone to sarcoma. Because after you've been through all the treatment and paid for all that, sometimes then you have to pay for the next uh, next thing. And it's it's hard. Um, it's very hard. So we do have those two big things that are kind of on our list um, of, of goals for the future for the organization. Yeah, it's challenging, but also interesting. And uh, can you share a memorable experience on store or a story from your time with foundation that had a profound impact on you? Sure. Um, so when we did have the team group, uh, there was a young lady who was 19. Uh, she was a freshman in college and she was one of the volunteer leads for the team group. She was sharing some of her personal story. And I had the realization that at such a young age, she, on a completely independent level, had to make the decision that was something I couldn't even fathom making as an adult. Um, she had had to make the decision at 19 to amputate her leg. Okay. And um, so she it was not her parents that made that decision. She made that decision. Uh, and she had to grow up very fast. And it broke my heart a little that she had to make a completely life altering decision um, at a, an incredibly young age. So, um, and she's now in her mid twenties, I think now. So yeah, she was yeah. even participating in like a para, like pre para Olympic groups and things like that. So she was getting involved in that type of stuff. So she was embracing it well. <laughs> Yeah, it's a touching story and working with the pediatric patients, especially we always encounter such kind of situations and it's sad, but uh, hopefully the sarcoma research is uh, improving and uh, we will find uh, someday the best cure for our patients. And uh, in your opinion, what qualities are essential for effective leadership in a non-profit organizations? Oh, allowing people to help. <laughs> uh, a lot of nonprofit leaders are what they call type A. We feel like we have to do it all ourselves. Um, but I really find that a lot allowing people to help, either your staff, your volunteers, your board, whatever that is. When people say they want to help an organization, you usually mean it. So finding ways to release that tight grip that we all seem to have on things um, and allow them to help do it for the organization. So I really try to make that part of my my mantra of allowing people to do uh, other things for us so yeah that's a really good um, point because uh, when you have a good team uh, everything every challenge uh, is um, possible to overcome and uh, let's uh, switch a little bit to your personal uh, life how do you balance your personal responsibilities with uh, personal interests uh, i'm i know that you have some interest in traveling camping and crafting so how do you uh, find that balance? Well, I do set my boundaries uh, for work, uh, time at work. Um, I do whatever is necessary to ensure that the organization functions smoothly. Um, there are certainly days that are longer, like with our upcoming Dragon Slayer walks in four cities. Um, those are long days um, during, after, and for our whole team. Uh, I also tell them to relax and recoup the days in between and, and afterwards, um, as long as our patients are supported uh, and their families are communicated with in a timely manner. So it's really setting boundaries um, and setting up time to do things. I like 
Uh, I know, and my staff and, and my board know that August, I go camping every year with my brothers. Um, you know, there's the third weekend in August, I'm out there camping with my brothers. Um, and then I have a, a small side crafting business that I do. So come November, I'm at craft fairs on the weekends. And I just have to communicate that well to my volunteers, my staff, my board. Um, and it's it's been successful so far. I haven't had too many, uh, you know, spinning plates fall and crash to the floor, but sometimes they're always inevitable. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, wonderful. And also, I guess next week you are going for camping. As it is, I a am. It is. Lazy. Yep, exactly that. I go camping with my brothers. I've, uh, I sadly, um, I lost my mom to a rare cancer, um, and my dad has also passed away. So this is the opportunity for my brothers and I to get together and make sure we see each other at least once a year. <laughs> they're lo they are local, but um, they're all busy people. So I will be out in the woods in about a week. So <laughs> okay. Thank you. So let's wrap up our, our interview. Thank you so much, Joe, for sharing your insights and experience with us today. It's been truly inspiring to learn about the incredible work that you are doing for sarcoma patients and sarcoma community. And I wish you continued success in your mission. Uh, thanks for uh, being here today. And um, yeah, we'll keep in touch. Thank you for having us and truly appreciate it. And um, if anybody needs to check us out, they know to find us on online at northwestsarcoma.org. So appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.